Well, if you're in the Old Testament and you ask the question, what is God like? Probably a, a young Jewish person would say, well, God is scary. God is like Mount Sinai, smoking, thundering like a volcano. Scary. If you ask one of Jesus' disciples, what is God like? They would say, well, I know this may be hard to believe, but God is actually like this person over here. God is like Jesus. In fact, he told us he came from the Father to show us what the Father is like. But Jesus didn't stay very long. He only worked, as far as we know, for maybe three years. And then he left and he actually said, it's for your good that I'm going away because now I'm turning the mission over to you. And for the world to find out what God is like now, the church is the answer to that. So the Apostle Paul, as he reflected, used the phrase, more than 30 times actually, he used the phrase, we are the body of Christ. Think about that. We are the presence of God in the world. God used to be present in his son Jesus, but Jesus left. And he said, it's actually good that I'm going away because I'm, I'm leaving you behind. And I'm giving you the mission of informing, the God, of informing the world and showing the world what God is like and sharing the good news of the gospel. So that's not how the phrase left behind is, is usually used. Of course, there were some books with that title. But for me, the church is the Jesus left behind because the only way the world will know what Jesus is like, what God is like, is through the church, the Jesus left behind. I was actually asked that very question on a, a secular radio station. I think they were disappointed to be interviewing a Christian author. You know, why am I wasting my time with this religious stuff? And uh, finally, the person turned to me and said, well, you wrote this book called What Good Is God? Tell me, what good is God? What, what has religion ever done that was good? And I said, well, I, I would answer that on several different levels. First is individuals. I could tell you stories of people in prison, of prostitutes, of alcoholics, of drug addicts, of people caught up in, in slavery and trafficking, people with leprosy, who were at the very low in terms of how they fit into society and their own feelings about themselves, their self-esteem. And they were transformed, truly transformed when they believed God loves me, God accepts me, God can change me. And I, I'm a journalist. I've reported hundreds of these stories of people, and I just have to take them at their word. So on the individual level, I have seen many people who are transformed. But not just that, in the community level. Someone asked me, uh, okay, what, what good, uh, what are, I wrote a book called Where Is God When It Hurts? And I would say, well, really the answer to that Kind of like our last question, where is the church when it hurts? And I've seen that again and again, where after a hurricane, after a tsunami, after uh, an earthquake, the church pours its resources, appears. Who, who were the first people who got the Ebola virus from other countries? They were Christian doctors. They were missionary doctors. And the church is on the front line. So the church is that community of support when the world needs it. And then eventually, it affects all of society. So you look at, uh, uh, go on the internet and, and look at sites like Transparency International. What are the least corrupt countries? What are the most prosperous countries? What are the countries that care most about the environment, that have most gender equality? I've done all of those. And in each one of them, about 19 out of the top 20 countries will be countries with a Christian heritage. Now, they're not necessarily strongly believing countries now. So Scandinavia, not that many people go to church. A lot of people don't even believe in God. But the gospel has its effect of changing all of society so that they turn, look at Scandinavia. They used to be tribes of warring Vikings, and now they are not. They're civilized, they're charitable, they're honest, they care about the environment. On all three of those levels, the individual, the community, the society, the gospel has its transforming effect.
There are some parts of the world where the gospel is news. It's something they've not heard before. And I have been to places, it's fun to speak in these places like the Philippines and parts of Brazil, parts of China, where you just come and tell the story of the gospel about God's love, God sending his son, etc. And people say, wow, that's wonderful. I, I want that, I want that. Well, it's, it's no longer news in Europe, in the United States. We've heard it. Your museums are full of the story. So it doesn't sound like news. And even in my lifetime, early on, Billy Graham could go to any stadium in the world and, and say, the Bible says, and people would say, oh, well, I must believe it. It must be right. Billy Graham said it. The Bible says it. Now people would say, well, so what? I don't believe the Bible. It's a book of myths. The Koran says something else. The Upanishads say, say something else. Uh, why should I be convinced? A theologian, actually from Croatia, used a phrase that helped me a lot. He said, he said in the old days, like that Billy Graham era, we could communicate the gospel head to head. I've, I, I know the truth. I will proclaim the truth. And then you will say, oh, yes, that is true. And you will believe it. It doesn't work so much anymore. We live in a pluralistic society where there are a lot of different ideas floating around. He said the most effective form of communication now is what he says, he, he describes as hand to heart to head. So we, we reach out with our hands and do acts of mercy. We'd, we'd live the gospel as Jesus did, acts of healing, acts of compassion. We live it, we, we affect people, we show up when there is a human need. And then the people wonder, why do they care about me? It touches their heart. Why do they care about sexual trafficking? Why do they care about the environment? Why do they care about poverty, about earthquakes, things like that? Why did they spend all this time rebuilding my house? And that opens their head. So hand to heart to head. The acts of mercy touch the heart. And then the person who is touched wants to know, why? What's behind that? What's your motivation? And they are open to receiving the gospel in a different way than if I just showed up at the door, knocked on the door and said, I want to tell you the truth. They're touched by the truth before they even know it.